workshop for December 19th. Um, and if there is no objection, we would like to move the legislative um, report as first on our agenda since we have guests here. Good afternoon. Thank you. Oh, there we go. Um, well, we're just going to take a few minutes like we normally do right before session and try to give you a preview of what we think we're going to see. And I will uh, warn you that that is changing about every five minutes as of this afternoon. So um, I don't, <laughs> we'll see, we'll see what happens in the next 30 minutes before we're done with our presentation because there's been some recent, very recent breaking developments. Um, so real quick, we'll, we'll talk just about um, what happened last year, because as you know, nothing in Richmond sort of happens in a vacuum. Obviously, this year actually might be the exception because everyone's starting from scratch in some respects. Um, but it's the last session for Governor McAuliffe. Probably more importantly, it was the last session for Speaker Bill Howe, who had been Speaker for a number of years. Um, he has retired, and they had the House had um, uh, designated Kirk Cox as Speaker as he needed for the left session. They also had a pretty significant biennial shortfall, about $1.5 billion that they had to close. Um, they used a lot of rainy day reserve funds to close that shortfall, which caught the attention of the bond rating agencies. And so the bond rating agencies put Virginia on the watch list, which made the legislature very cautious. And so we've seen a little bit of that. And we'll talk about this a little bit later on in the governor's most recent introduced budget, which came out yesterday. Um, Terry McCall, once again, tried to expand Medicaid. He tried that every single year of his term. It never worked. Once again, we'll talk about that later on because the dynamics of that are changing. And as we'll also be talking about, it was a big year for elections with all 100 members of the House and all three statewide positions. Uh, so statewide, uh, you should all know this, but just as a recap, in case you were under a rock the last couple of months, which some of us wish we might have been, um, uh, the Lieutenant Governor, Ralph Northam, won. He beat Ed Gillespie pretty sizably. I think the margin on that was much broader than a lot of people had anticipated or thought. Uh, Justin Fairfax beat Joe Vogel. Justin had, this was really his first foray into politics. Uh, Jill Vogel is a current sitting state senator and she will remain the state senator. She did not have to give up her seat to run in this election. Uh, and then Mark Herring, who was the current attorney general, beat John Adams, who, um, as you might have heard me say, is actually related to the John Adams. So John Adams unfortunately lost the election. So a long time for him. <laughs> um, a couple stats about the, the governor's race. First off, uh, Gillespie did really well <coughs> compared to every previous governor. Um, the only person that, that beat him was Ralph Norman. Um, he got more votes than McAuliffe, more votes than McDonald. Um, but uh, as Joel said, there was a pretty pretty big margin there um, between uh, Northam and Gillespie. Um, this chart also has that yet yeah, yellow line is the turnout number. Um, so turnout was about 47%, which is pretty high for a gubernatorial race. Um, it is not the highest we've seen ever, but um, it is a, a pretty high number um, nonetheless. Um, this map shows uh, sort of where all those votes um, came from. So obviously the, the red are the fairly rural localities. Um, and you'll see um, the, more, the more urban localities are, are sort of the blue, which is where uh, Northern got most of his votes. Obviously, Northern Virginia turned out very strongly for, for Northern. I think the other surprise is this lightish blue here down in the middle. That's Chesterfield County, which voted for a Democrat for the first time in um, it was 40 years. So um, that's a, a big deal. The other sort of interesting thing about this chart is um, go back 20 years to the Gilmore gubernatorial race. The top three localities for Republicans were Virginia Beach, Henrico, um, and Chesterfield. Fast forward to this election, the top three localities for a Republican were Hanover, Bedford, and Augusta. <laughs> so you go from three suburban uh, localities to three fairly rural localities, mostly, with the exception really of Hanover, mostly west of, of 95. Um, this next chart just shows the, the population. These are 2010 numbers, so um, uh, if we had them updated for 2017, the, the dark blues would be even darker than they are just showing that the, the population centers that are continuing to grow are where that Democratic base um, is coming from. Um, on the House race, this is really the story um, of the election. 
Um, and I'm going to apologize in advance, this chart is now out of date. <laughs> <laughs> so this chart shows the House of Delegates last year uh, with a 66-34 Republican majority. Um, it sh shows a 51-49 uh, Republican majority headed into um, the session, but as of about an hour ago, that is no longer the case. Um, Shelley Simons has defeated uh, David Yancey by a whopping one vote in the court news. <laughs> Um, the recount court has to certify that result tomorrow morning um, before it is official, but um, there is a, a very a drastic change in the power in the House of Delegates. I would say that if you ever want to have a civics lesson about the importance of voting, I mean, this is it. This is every vote counts. This is not just coming down to one election. This is control of the House of Delegates came down to one election one vote so that's that's pretty remarkable um, and we are not done with recounts um, we have a, a, a couple others um, and you know we knew that the Yancey one was going to be interesting because of how close it was but um, the, the last one will also be interesting so so first we had um, there were six races that were eligible for recount in Virginia we don't have any automatic recounts um, if you lose you have to request the recount um, so only four of the losers requested recounts um, Dante Tanner in um, uh, Prince William Fairfax District uh, requested a recount. Um, they found seven votes uh, for Tanner from missed tallies, and so um, uh, Delegate Hugo was uh, recertified as the winner by 99 votes uh, last week. Um, today, uh, they uh, found a number of votes for both uh, Shelley Simons and David Yancey, but at the end of the day, um, they there was a net increase for Shelley Simons of 11 votes. Um, and so tomorrow that recount court will we expect to certify that result. <clears throat> My, our understanding from the press and everything that's been reported is that there were not any challenged ballots throughout the day. And that would have been the grounds for either side to challenge um, those results in court tomorrow. So um, that's what we expect to happen. Um, then also tomorrow, the um, uh, Richmond, Chesterfield seat of Delegate Lupasi um, that recount will happen. Um, he's down by 336 votes, um, so a much larger margin to make up. Uh, and then last, but certainly not least, um, the 28th district, which is Speaker Howell, who's retiring his district. Um, Bob Thomas is up by 82 votes in that district. What is probably more interesting about that race is there was a split precinct um, in uh, uh, Stafford County between the 28th district and the 88th house district where a number of voters were assigned to the wrong precinct. Um, there is a lawsuit that has been filed in federal court uh, asking for some, uh, uh, somehow to fix that problem. Um, that hearing isn't until January 5th. Um, so we may not have true resolution on that um, until then. And, and you know, there's speculation about whether the court would ask for a special election or you know, what could happen there. Um, but now that the Democrats have picked up one seat to get to 50-50, um, you know, if one of these other recount, you know, the Bob Thomas recount goes the other way, they, you know, could look, be looking at an outright majority of 51-49. So, apart from kind of the obviously shift in the House of Delegates and, and the control of how that's all going to work, the other thing that's happened is obviously a significant loss of institutional knowledge and committee re realignment. This is just House Appropriations Committee. You can see it with all the strike throughs of, of folks who either did not run or lost. And seven of the 22 members of House Appropriations will no longer be on House Appropriations anymore. And so not only do you have that significant loss, but you also have the committee realignment based upon the, the new um, uh, ratios in the House of Delegates. So that, that's going to make for some interesting dynamics as new members come on these really critical and important committees that have not sat on these committees before. And another chart, which this is a really interesting one that uh, VPAP put together, that shows kind of the decline in institutional knowledge over the last 20 years. And you can see back in 1998, you kind of have a 30-30-30 split with a little more emphasis at the, those middle years. But now we've got almost half of the members of the Journal Assembly have been there for less than five years. Uh, 47 of them in the House, and you only have 16 members who have been there for more than 15 years. What sometimes that leads to is the institutional knowledge is now 
always with the staff, and particularly in House Appropriations and Senate Finance, those staff members have been around for a long time. They have a lot of the institutional knowledge, and so I think you will see some of these new members certainly maybe leaning on that staff more more than they would have in normal, normal circumstances. The other kind of interesting thing, now that we're at 50-50, um, most members have never seen the power sharing arrangement, which has been something that they conceivably will have to figure out, um, except for these sort of 16 members down here, because they did have to do this back in the 90s. So how these other 47 plus members uh, go about doing that will, will certainly be interesting to watch. So stay tuned on that one. A little bit about the transition. Um, so uh, Governor Northam is obviously preparing his government uh, to be up and running. Uh, he is sworn in on January 13th. Um, he's named one of our colleagues, Marion Radcliffe, to be the director of his transition. Uh, she's joined by Doris Cross Mays, Joni Ivey, and Todd Stottlemyer as co-chairs of the transition team. Uh, so far, he has announced a number of cabinet secretaries and chief of staff. So Clark Mercer is his current chief of staff, will be remaining as chief of staff as governor. Uh, Aubrey Lane, who's the current secretary of transportation, will be moving over at, to the secretary of finance. Um, Carlos Hopkins currently <coughs> serves as the secretary of veterans and defense affairs um, under uh, Governor McAuliffe. Uh, Shannon Valentine will be serving as the Secretary of Transportation. She is a former member of the House of Delegates from Lynchburg and is a current member of the Commonwealth Transportation Board. Um, Matt Strickler may be named, a number of you recognize. He used to serve as then Senator Northam's legislative aide um, back when he was in the state Senate. He'll serve as uh, Secretary of Natural Resources. Uh, Bettina Ring is the current state forester, and that is something I learned that we did not, I didn't, I learned that we had. I didn't know we had a state forester. So she's a veteran of the Department of Forestry um, and will serve as the Secretary of Agriculture and Forestry. And Brian will, Moran will remain in his current role as Secretary of Public Safety and Homeland Security. Um, we hear that they will be doing um, health and human resources tomorrow. Um, but there are still a number of other secretaries, including education, obviously, which you all care about, um, that uh, they have yet to, or they are in the final stages of deciding and, you know, we should announce it in the coming weeks. Um, looking ahead to uh, next session, um, and, and obviously uh, there's a lot more stuff on the table now um, that we are likely at 50-50, um, but it is a budget year, and so the budget will be, uh, I think, one of the driving discussions. Um, the governor did release his budget, uh, proposed budget yesterday. Um, he did include um, some of the drivers in that budget, or he did include uh, fully funding uh, Medicaid growth uh, and the inflation increase. Uh, he also did fully uh, implement Medicaid expansion uh, and realized about a $400 million savings over the biennium, which he, he did end up spending in a number of different areas. Uh, including a 2% salary increase for state employees, state-supported locals, uh, and SOQ-supported um, uh, positions. So that's about $101 million in the biennium. Uh, as Joel mentioned earlier, we've been dinged uh, a little bit by the rating agencies. We've uh, been on a negative outlook because of our use of some one-time dollars uh, in this current budget. Uh, and so uh, both the governor and the General Assembly have decided to set up a reserve fund um, that uh, is a little, you know, has a, they have a little bit more leeway with than the rainy day fund, um, and uh, his uh, appropriations into that fund bring it to about four hundred million dollars, which is like two percent of general fund revenues, um, which is sort of what their goal was by the end of, of this current biennium, um, and then obviously fully funded rebenchmarking, and I'll let I'll let Joel talk the rest about the, the K twelve stuff. Just a few other sort of policy options, obviously restoration of rights and. Uh, the possible implementation of an automatic restoration of rights is, is definitely, you know, uh, something that we'll be talking about moving forward. Um, continued conversation about COPN reform, uh, the decriminalization of, of marijuana, whether it's just uh, for, for medical purposes or full decriminalization, obviously a, a, a robust conversation uh, moving forward, especially with uh, Senate Majority Leader, you know, Tommy Norman indicating his support on that issue. Um, You've got the uh, Confederate statues uh, issue, with, uh, some of the riot management problems that uh, the state has been dealing with, and what authority the state has uh, versus what the localities have. So, um, 
looking at that, and, and you know, we've already touched on, I think the, the real conversation is gonna be the institutional knowledge. Um, not only are we all in a new building, um, but we're looking at a, a very young legislature, and so um, you know, people that have very little, um, any, or almost no elected um, experience whatsoever. Um, I think the freshman class of 19, two of them have previous elected uh, office experience on the local level, so um, it is a, a very fresh new uh, class, and, and getting them up to speed quickly is going to be a challenge for everybody. Yeah, and, and making that transition for them from a campaign mentality to a legislative governing mentality, and that, that takes some shifting, and you know, it will be interesting to see how all those things start to pan out. So, um, Moving kind of specifically to some specific K-12 issues, there's a number of things that we have seen over the years that I anticipate that we will see once again over the next um, General Assembly session. One is virtual Virginia. You know, this is you know, a bill, I'm not going to explain it. Virginia, 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 and they did make it out of the Senate, and then both of them were um, were vetoed by the governor. But there was a number of Republicans in the House that voted no on both of those bills. And so I think the passage of those bills, even at a fifty-one forty-nine House, gets a whole lot murkier. So I I, I don't want to say they're not going to make it out of the House, but I think it's the, this going to be a significant uphill battle for those to get the House. Um, he, there were a number of Republicans who voted no that actually lost. So, but anyway, there's still that will still be interesting. Um, Opening school before Labor Day, you know, we'll see all those bills again. Uh, that will be the. I expect those bills to get out of the House. That continues to be the one thing that um, the Senate Majority Leader Tommy Norman and the Senate Minority Le Minority Leader Dick Sazal agree on is that they both do not like that bill. So I don't expect to get out of the Senate because the dynamics in the Senate have not changed at all. Uh, school discipline, as you all know, and we've talked about significantly, those bills. <coughs> will come back in some shape or form. I think the bill that I expect that we will definitely see is probably the one that would um, eliminate suspension and expulsion for K through three. Um, whether the other ones come back, I don't know, but I think we can definitely expect to see the elementary school one back this session. And workforce development continues to be an issue. Um, the governor-elect campaign on workforce development, he's <coughs> talked a lot about re workforce development. Um, uh, Governor McAuliffe put an additional $2 million in his budget for certifications or credentialing scholarships to the community college system. So this is going to be, once again, a, a big focus, not only this year, but I think going ahead, because I don't think anyone's thought that we have actually figured out our workforce development programs here. In Virginia. The other issue that we've not seen, but we've certainly talked about all these, is teacher shortage. Teacher shortage is going to be a primary focus of the General Assembly. I think no matter what, no matter the composition of the House, they're going to be talking about this a lot because this has gotten a lot of bipartisan support, a lot of bipartisan discussion. We've even seen one bill that was introduced already that would allow for provisional license for military spouses moving to Virginia. So we've already seen some of these things starting to flow into um, uh, the system, so there will be a whole lot more before it's all said and done. Uh, dual enrollment is going to be another focus, but it's going to be focused in the context of the Virginia Community College system as a whole. There was a JLARC study that came out back in September uh, that had um, some a number of recommendations around the community college system, around dual enrollment, around the transferability of dual enrollment credits to four-year institutions, all those things. So I expect that we'll see a number of bills and certainly probably kind of a comprehensive bill focusing on community college system, dual enrollment, transferability of those credits, all those types of things that will get a lot of attention this year. Um, and as Ross mentioned, and I'll talk about it here a little more in a second, free benchmarking, a big portion of the budget, roughly $500 million of the governor's introduced budget is, is free benchmarking. And the special education regional tuition is something that we're going to talk about a lot too. Um, the CSA funding, went up significantly in the governor's budget. And from what I understand, the primary reason for that has been um, towards private placement. So that, that is going to continue to get discussion because it is such a big line item in the budget. We also saw last, I think it was last week, all my weeks are blending together now, but last week there was also another JLARC report that just came out about early education in Virginia that had a number of recommendations in it around 
um, quality, around mixed delivery, around um, all different types of things. They had about 20 recommendations that came out of that report related to early education. Some of them dealing with um, voluntary home visiting programs. So some of them were on the DSS side. Some of them were on the DOE side. But I think that that will be something that we'll probably see some legislation on this year as well. Uh, then we still got these work groups that are kind of hanging out there. I don't know what's going. I don't know the, the the future of these work groups. I don't know if they start to peter out just because some of the individuals who really took leadership and ownership of these work groups are no longer in the General Assembly. So I don't know the fate of those, except that the Future of Education Joint Committee, which is the one that is kind of chaired by Senator Newman, who chairs uh, Senate Ed and Health, and Delegate Steve Landis, who chairs House <coughs> Education. Those two kind of drive the discussion on that. So I expect that to be around. But in terms of SOL innovation and school readiness and some of the others, um, I, I, I don't know whether they continue on sort of in the same format that they will they had in the past. Uh, here are a couple of highlights, and we are still making our way through the budget. So this is not intended to be a comprehensive list, but just a couple of things I wanted to point out. As I mentioned, rebenchmarking is about $487 million. <clears throat> Uh, so that is obviously a big portion of the budget. I think um, I was just talking to Farrell before the meeting started. We, we haven't yet run our calculation on it yet. Uh, we get a little more money for rebenchmarking. Our LCI went up a little bit. So what that means at the end of the day, I don't think we fully know <coughs> yet, but we'll look at that. Um, and, but I will kind of jump ahead a few, a few bullets down. The governor also put in $11.5 million for Hold Harmless. So, with the recognition that a lot of composite indexes went up statewide, they put in a little bit of money that said, if you lost money over rebenchmarking, because that was a possibility, we're gonna hold you harmless for the first year. So you're gonna lose anything versus what you got last year. I don't know if we're gonna fall in that category or not. I, I, don't, I don't think so, but we'll have to wait and see once we do all the calculations <coughs> on that. You might recall, um, it might have been seven or eight years ago, right as the housing bubble burst and the Northern Virginia, because the, there's a heavy um, influence of real estate prices on the composite index when the housing bubble burst in the Northern Virginia, all their composite index came way down. Everyone else's, because it's a, it's a balancing act, everyone else's went way up, including ours. And uh, the outgoing governor, Tim came at that point, froze the composite indexes the incoming governor, um, Bob McDonald, unfroze the composite indexes and became this whole mess because then everyone was a loser at that point because <laughs> it was kind of this odd thing. And they actually ended up doing just this. They put in money at the end of the day to sort of hold everyone harmless, um, and including Northern Virginia. So a little bit of that. So as Ross mentioned, uh, there was a salary increase. It starts in the second year, so it's really six months of, of, of it. It's not a whole lot, but it's about 51 Point two million dollars. So that's only the state share of um, teachers and SQ supported positions. They also did something interesting, which was a full time principal in every elementary school. So they have funded that, uh, which is a, actually a technically an update to the SOQs because I don't think the SOQs do that. They also put in five thousand dollars a year to automate the teacher licensing process. So right now, if, if you've gone through the licensing process, you know it's all done by paper and it's a, a giant headache. So this will hopefully be be a positive movement in that direction. And then uh, the PBIS supports, they put in about $500,000 a year uh, for training for that. So I think the kind of a recognition that we got to do something about suspensions, expulsions, putting some money into training is kind of the direction that they're taking as of right now the budget. Uh, looking ahead to the calendar, Pre-filing has already started, so we've already seen the number of bills. As I mentioned yesterday, the governor's budget came out. A couple weeks here, session will start, which always puts a damper on us for Christmas because you always put me in the back of your head. Um, <laughs> January 19th is the last day to introduce bills, so we'll we'll have a full picture of what's happening out there as of January 19th. February 13th is crossover, so all the House bills that are still alive have to go to the Senate. All the Senate bills that are still alive have to go to the House, and then the <laughs> projected adjournment date is March 10th. Uh, whether they make it to March 10th and have everything done remains to be seen. The one thing that the General Assembly has to do is they have to pass the budget. So that has to get done. They cannot leave before they pass the budget. So they, no matter what, which I think is always a good thing because it forces everyone to sort of come together since this is one thing they absolutely have to get done. 
that was quick and appreciate your time, but happy mm -hmm. to answer any questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Well done. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Okay. Um, under admin matters, before we begin, uh, I want to announce that we, we will have a closed session after our formal meeting. But before we do the closed session, we will have an additional workshop uh, immediately following the formal meeting. Um, and it will be about um, compensation, compensation strategies. strategies. And so uh, we weren't sure, because Farrell's been gone, we weren't sure we were going to have it ready. But uh, it is ready, and so he's ready to talk about some compensation strategies to so um, I don't know how long it'll be, but I'm sure he's got it all together, and we can we can listen and uh, yeah, it's take it all in. It's going to be Mr. Mira, but we needed Carol here to verify our thinking. So, oh. so so we'll do that, and then we'll go into closed after that. And and so will we need to be in here for the um, for the additional workshop, or or do we come? Ideally, again? we would come back down here. Okay, all right. So we'll come back down here then after the formal meeting. Okay. Um, and going in now to board leadership interests. This is the interest part. Uh, we're not nominating tonight. We're just talking about um, who's interested in board leadership um, starting in January. So, um, who'd like to go first? <laughs> Joel? Thank you. Um, I'd like to submit myself for consideration by the board to serve as vice chair for next year. Um, I believe deeply in service and I deeply believe in our schools. That's why I was attracted to work for the school division in 2006 as a data support specialist and a driving reason why I ran for the school board in 2012 and 2016. Um, I believe being vice chair is another opportunity for service, service to you, and my colleagues on the board. Um, while serving as vice chair would be an honor and a privilege, I also view it as a responsibility to work for each of you. Uh, I know I'm not a perfect board member and that there's been times where there's been strong disagreements. Um, I can't promise that as a board member that I'll be perfect or that there won't be disagreements in the future. Uh, but what I can promise is that in board leadership, I will serve with an eye toward fairness and inclusion and work to ensure that every member of the board has the opportunity to be heard and advocate for what they believe. Uh, with that, I ask for your confidence and consideration in serving you as your vice chair next year. Any others? Yes. Got it. Um, it is my pleasure to recommend Dan Edwards as vice chair. I'm honored to support him as a candidate for vice chair and have no hesitation in recommending him to continue his current role on the board. Some have been led to believe that he was not willing to serve. I talked with Dan today, quite to the contrary. He's eager and interested in serving us and the public. Um, his past performance has demonstrated outstanding leadership abilities. He and Mrs. Anderson have worked well together for one year, and it is only one year. We really need to give the both of them two years at least. Um, when he has a concern, one thing I like about Dan, when he has a concern or a question about an issue, he speaks his mind clearly and directly. He gives voice to what others may feel they cannot or will not say. Even though there are pros and cons to issues, he is decisive when one weighs more, heavy, one weighs more heavily than the other. He is not indecisive. In other words, he does not vacillate. I appreciate that. Dan always behaves professionally. His comments are well thought out and clearly articulated. He gets along well with others and he takes his responsibilities seriously. And more important, he's personable and easy to work with. And he also keeps calm under pressure. I have never observed him creating pointless drama. We don't need that on the board. He demonstrates ability to handle critical situations. His professional skills plus his gifts of perception have gained the trust of parents and their families. Let's face it, children and parents are our clients and we need to be able to relate to them. And for this reason, I feel he will make, he will continue to make an outstanding contribution to our board. Uh, also, 
Dan, with his years of experience, is at ease and comfortable in all diverse and social situations. Let's face it, we all have a PR job, but the chair and the vice chair especially, because they represent us in a lot of situations where we aren't there. Um, so I think that he and Mrs. Anderson exhibit a highly honed social skills and are at ease in a group of five people or a thousand. So I'll repeat again, it is my pleasure to recommend Dan Edwards to continue on as a vice chair. I'm really satisfied with the chair and the, the way the chair and the vice chair have carried out our promises to the public this year. Thank you. Mr. Edwards. I may have sent mixed signals. Um, I told Joel all along that I, that I uh, thought he would be a fine vice chair, and I still absolutely think that. I was asked today, point blank, would you be willing to serve, continue to serve? And I said, I'd be willing, but only if, you know, I'm not soliciting it, um, but I'm willing to continue if the majority of the, of, of the board wants it. And in the same breath, I'm saying that I think Joel McDonald uh, can do a good job as well. I think the fact that we're not discussing the chair leads to the obvious question. Mrs. Anderson, can I assume that you are going to seek re-election? I am seeking re-election. Just, re just to clarify that. I think most of us assume that. But, <coughs> I am um, seeking re-election. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Riggs? And I wanted to speak to the chair. Can I speak to that? Yes. About the chair now? Yes. Uh, I just want to um, reiterate that um, I think Beth Anderson would be um, it would be good for her to continue being our chair for the school board. She uh, has the leadership <coughs> qualities um, that we need to look for. She has integrity. She has vision. I feel like she's trustful. Um, and she has, she's personable. She has a lot of experience in the school system. I think she's done a very good job. I like the fact when she answers um, parents when they have questions, she gives them more information or she answers their questions. It's not like a two sentence thing and they they go away thinking my question wasn't answered. I think she's <coughs> thorough with that. I think that's important. If someone takes the time to write us or to call us and ask us about something <coughs> they have a concern on, I think it's it's we should be answering their questions and I like that she does that. So I just want to say that uh, I will continue to support Bev. Um, I think she's doing a great job. Are there any others? Ms. McLeod. Um, <coughs> I actually, and I had approached Joel, I haven't spoken to him recently, but I actually approached Joel um, several months ago about him to consider running for chairperson. Um, so I was hoping that's what he was going to say that he was willing to do. Um, I think he's a fine leader. I think he is absolutely able to work with people of uh, opposite opinions. Um, if Dan is willing to stay as the vice chair, um, I would love it if Joel would consider to go ahead and run for chair. Although I don't like the look that on a board of predominantly women, we would put two men in leadership. Um, but having said that, um, if there is... Um, <coughs> many things throughout the last year so i haven't um i've tried to be as reasonable as possible i have tried to bring folks to consensus as pot as much as i possibly can um i've tried to attempt to be the voice of i'll call it voice of reason i i my first term serving was with todd davidson and there was nobody better than that and so i think i try to channel my inner dr davidson as much as i possibly can um I think there is much improvement that can be done in the workability of this group. I believe that Joel could do that, but if Joel is not willing to run for chairman, then I will throw my hat in the ring for the chairman position. Anyone else? Okay. I don't really have a nomination, except that I would, I also support <laughs> Beth continuing as chair. Thank you. Okay. Um, Want to move on with anybody else? Okay. Um, next on the agenda is um, our schedule of meetings. I'm going to pass this down. This is a, a copy. 
Did you have one? Do you need a copy? I'm okay. Well, I'll just see if you need it. Don't mind. Don't mind, sir. <clears throat> um, <laughs> any suggestions? Take a look at it and um, see if you have any suggestions or comments. If you have an extra one, will you pass it back this way? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. January 9th, our first meeting at the new year? Yes, it is. Okay. Which is the second Tuesday, as we've changed our meeting um, schedules. So, in particular, uh, uh, February 6th is a special meeting, and March 6th is that special meeting, both of those uh, concerning budget. I think it should say at the top where it says um, in the recommendation it should say second and fourth Tuesday not second and third <laughs> that was a, just a oversight I think mm -hmm. <clears throat> any other comments um, I just yeah. wanted to ask yes. is January 30th and 31st still our planned retreat it's not on here it was on the online calendar but okay um, uh, we are not having a, a retreat this January I mean you just have some additional time given to you <laughs> Yay. okay thank you I just want to flag that the February 6th meeting is the final day people will probably be making their way back and be here hopefully in time for it but uh, last day of the NSBA advocacy institute mm -hmm. in DC since it's a special meeting it'd be helpful if we get indication of what time maybe you could be back and then we can set that whenever yeah it works I, for you all. probably a last seven o'clock start or something like mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Yeah. what do you all think how many of you are going to be up in in DC for um, one, Four. two, three. A couple of us will have to check the Amtrak. Yeah. I mean, the train leaves fairly early, I think. No, it doesn't, actually, if you go back, does it? Right. It's at 8.30 at night. Okay. We'll double well, check. But we can look at the, at the Newport News option. Too. Yeah. Just a reminder, the reason for that special meeting is because the, of the shift the in the schedules, and we've got to get the estimate needs to City Council. Right. This happened time last time, time, too, I remember. Yeah. We were That's back fair. in time. We well, it was it actually a real time. meeting now. This is just the estimate needs. Right. So, so it should be easier to handle. No. A 6 or 6.30 6 start? Or, or yeah. later. I'll double check times. I haven't looked at it that deeply. Yeah, yeah. We, can, yeah. we can confirm a start yeah. at the next meeting. We don't okay. need to do agenda right. until January on that one. So can you all check your schedules, and, and yep. especially <coughs> Mr. Edwards, if you're taking the train up there, will you check the schedule and see if you Mr. can be back? Carl and I think are both amp tracking. Yeah, oh, you're both amp tracking. Okay. <laughs> I'm driving. I'll okay. Back on time. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe I'll be hitchhiking. <laughs> <laughs> maybe we'll have some hitchhikers for you then. How's that? Mm -hmm. All right. Any other comments? Be sure to put that on the agenda for questioning next time. Um, next, we have committee assignments. And, and usually this time of year, usually it's because the reason that's on here is because if we've had elections, we have to make some adjustments, but when we don't have elections, um, unless there's someone who, you know, hasn't happy with, with their committee or whatever, our, our, our main time to uh, change committee assignments is in July, not, not now. So this is, I think, pretty much put on here because we just... We normally do it if we've had elections. We've had we have to make adjustments. I think adjustments. it's in your bylaws to reaffirm in January. Right. Okay. So. Yeah. And that may also, obviously, if the leadership positions on the board change, that may change some of the makeup of the committees. Right. So if the if the leadership positions change and and you'd like to make some changes, that will be addressed in January. 
not not today we won't we won't make any changes today this is just for your information so that if there is a leadership change in, in January that the new leadership would have a chance to make those adjustments yes so are we saying right now if we have a problem with any of our committee assignments then my, my, what we've done in the past is my suggestion is send your issues suggestions preferences to Diane and she'll hold them and pass them to the well, leadership. Well, it's not changing a committee. It's, for example, um, I would prefer to ha uh, now have a morning discipline committee because that works better for my schedule. If possible, if someone's willing to switch with me, um, it's my, my schedule has changed and a morning session would be, unless the, our whole committee could switch to morning um, time frame. Just throw that out there. That's a possibility. I, mean, I can make it work if I have to, but morning is better for me. Okay. One of the things I've noticed about discipline and when I've substituted is that we've run extremely late. Yeah. Um, and so um, I kind of agree. I'd like to see one of those afternoon committees um, <clears throat> moved up a time, move the time up, either either a two o'clock start or even a morning start for one of those committees. And so I'd like for you all to think about that. Um, I think it maybe even a morning start might even be better because that way if you ran later I, I, last week i substituted it for one of the afternoon meetings and we were here till seven o'clock or almost seven o'clock principals out of their building yeah, yeah. that's a, that's the downside mm -hmm. of the morning is you're wiping out a half the day right, i'll discuss with yeah. some folks all right yeah. someone okay. will, i may be able to someone will switch with you. okay especially now that that's Thank a first you. and third and now it's a two and four i like to keep on monday <laughs> All right, so that's something that we'll talk about also in January. Um, Ms. McLeod, you had something. Yes, ma'am. Ready for me? So if you would each take one of these and pass it, this is kind of a cover note, and then the second sheet is what we'll discuss. Um, so pr prior, about, I don't know, five, six months ago, um, it was brought to the board yeah, regarding right. concerns over some ways to sole uh, source contracting. <laughs> so with this time, I wanted to bring with a better, better explanation um, of what we're bringing to you right here. So I've done kind of a little memo to all of you, um, just saying that, you know, we have received the recent audit findings and concerns from the review from the last few months with the inconsistencies in policies and noncompliance with policies and procedures. And subsequently, Dr. Spence has responded as well as some of his senior staff. And I think we can all be agreeable that the, the response has been appropriate and we appreciate the current process and policies are being reviewed. They're being communicated to senior staff, the principals and all, and potentially updated to ensure legal guidelines are being followed as well as for a better efficiency in the division. However, as we continue to have citizens that come to speak to us regarding disparity study and, and we serve in a climate where transparency continues to be um, brought to our attention on the importance of, and it's our responsibility for oversight of the taxpayer's dollar. I'm, sus, sus, uh, excuse me, I'm submitting the following request along with Carolyn and, and Vicki's support and would appreciate any, anyone else's support as well. The first one and I have attached and would have ready for Cami today is a, a request for a legal opinion. Um, it is that, so that's the second sheet. And I wanted to kind of explain the why. This isn't a, a loosey goosey, um, you know, trying to throw somebody under the bus, that kind of a thing. It's, it's, we really want to have a better understanding. So, um, the legal opinion is regarding sole source contracts. And our reason for the request is to ensure that no violations of the Virginia Public Procurement Act were made and that we can move forward with confidence. So I pasted in there for you, the Virginia Public Procurement Act. And I highlighted the section that brings concern excuse me, concern. It's, you know, we want to make sure that things are being done with avoidance of impropriety or the appearance of impropriety and that all qualified vendors have access to public business and that no offer can be arbitrarily or capriciously excluded. The second request we have on this is we would very much, and that's one of our things to discuss tonight, is to have a workshop on this. We need to better understand the process and what we're doing. So, Madam Chair, that is our request. The, the um, support document here that's put together um, it explains that we're asking Ms. Linetti for a legal opinion. We've provided um, three examples of sole source contracts here. Um, and it shows, some of the things it shows is that it was, you know, the date that it was submitted, <coughs> the amount it was submitted, but then it also starts showing that the dates that some of the contracts, like, actually put in action, the, the work started being done 
before things were actually approved. And that brings great concerns. We want to make sure that it doesn't have the appearance of impropriety. So that's why we're asked. We gave three opportunities here. I mean, there were cases actually that the, um, the sole source was disapproved, but the work had already begun, and then it was approved after the case. So we are asking for these three. We picked three randomly. They're all on our, we got them from the school website. Everything's there. Anybody can go look at the, the contracts. We picked three that we would like to be reviewed and to feel confident that um, that we are following this process correctly. So um, the five questions are on the back is, you know, have any of these policies that we've done been violated? Have we violated in any way the Virginia Public Procurement Act? Um, specifically, but not li limited to C, which section C is what I put pasted in here for you in the letter portion, all right? As well as E, which was upon determination writing that there is only one source practically available for which it is to be procured. We want to make sure that we're, we're following that portion. I feel like the review we're doing on the process <coughs> is good, but it didn't address sole source specifically. And so if we find anything, then what are the next steps required by all of us, the 11 of us around this table, and, and what is our liability if we don't make sure things are put into place? So it'll be, a, you know, for Cammy to go and provide that to us, as well as to ask please to have a workshop um, I do have, a, um, not on this, but an additional part, um, when we asked for how we might, um, you know, Dr. Spence, you asked budget-wise some things that we needed. Yeah, this board rotates people on and off. And so I think it would be important if you have a four-year term, if every, every four years we went and had um, that one year we got a lesson in sole source and the next year we got a lesson and you just kind of take the budget and chunk it out and explain chunks of the budget to folks. I think it'd be really helpful if you come up with a four year rotation, then that means over the course of four years, you're going to learn about everything that you're dealing with in the budget process. And then as people rotate on, no matter when they rotate every two years, if it doesn't repeat, you know, until every four years, then that means everyone is eventually going to have all of those kind of sessions, you know, that 101 kind of and the parts of the budget. So it would be, because we can't read, um, and the viewing public won't like this, I mean, we don't read every single solitary line of the budget when we're going through it. But you were asking, what do we want to know? So, you know, I think right now, this year, I think this is pretty clear, we're gonna wanna talk about this in the budget process better. Sure. And so I think that may be one um, one way to do this. But I at least wanted to at, at request a workshop on sole source contracts. So, Madam Chair, that is um, our request. If anyone else would like to join in and agree with this, feel free. I'm gonna give this information to Tammy as well. Okay, I appreciate you. you bringing this forward. Um, and, um, I do know that uh, administration has started proceedings to uh, make some changes already in this regard. So, Dr. Spence, if, if you want to speak to that now or you want to wait, um, it's up to you. Well, I mean, what, we, what we've what we responded to are really some of the specific findings in the audit report. I think these are legitimate questions. I, I look forward to having a conversation with you all about that and with Kim. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Mr. Edwards. The... Uh, the legal opinion would uh, appropriately require a vote by the board, yeah. no, it and um, it this is kind of a. I didn't have any heads up on this. I'm not sure who who at the table here did, and I'm not really comfortable voting on it tonight. Um, it doesn't require a vote. We just simply ask the the chair <coughs> to go and submit it to. I, 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 I believe there's a requirement for the board to yeah, agree to it. Into it. I think we're going to be able to see the chair. Yeah, that's what your chair has to submit it. Well, I suspect right. the chair would probably want to know how the board felt. Yeah. Right. I, I, what you could do is the board, if you look at this and decide if you want to expand it or change the nature any more about it, I think that's appropriate for the board to say, yes, we agree, or you know, but we'd like to see a couple other things on that. I haven't looked at all this to tell you everything's in there. I don't know if you all need to look at it if you want me to stay that the team would be on once the now to Okay. So um so I will read this and go over it and I, I may even be calling you and talking with you more about it. Thank you. And um our next meeting um I may be chair and I may not, so whoever the if whoever the chair is at that point in time can come before this board and, and we'll just do a, a straw poll to see how many people <coughs> would like us to um, move forward with this. Is that all right with you? No, not really, but yeah. 
Um, well, I've read this the policies matters. and the bylaws state that uh, a legal opinion should be submitted through the school board chair, but it does right. not say that the school board chair has to approve it. Right. So says the chairman shall forward the request to the school shall board. Yeah. Right, right. It so does that, say that. So you're going to forward So you're going to forward because it's a shall. Okay. I'll shall. I shall forward, but however, <laughs> I shall forward it. Mm -hmm. um, but but I would like to read it. Sure, read it uh, thoroughly. That's why we and, brought it for and everybody. Cause we got it's everybody. Everybody different. Yeah. Yeah. And, and not like Dr. Spence. I mean, it's a good conversation because there, you know, this started six months ago mm -hmm. with right. um, some some questions. So we as we're responsible. We've got a fiduciary responsibility, and we need to know. We need to know and and protect ourselves and protect our staff and mm -hmm. everything. I agree. Okay. Miss Rye. <clears throat> and I just felt it's prudent to mention, since it's germane to this topic, that at the last policy meeting, uh, there was a green light given to proceed with the revised sole source policy, quite expanded. And it's been uh, in the works for many months. And that'll be up on SharePoint very shortly for everybody. Thank you. And that was as much driven by staff request as school board request. That is true. It was. Well, so and that in is response to the legal opinion that was previously requested, quite frankly, so right. around sole source. I mean, this isn't the first time that request has been made. So. Right. So I won't drag my feet on this, but I will talk with you about it further. Thank you. Okay. All right, and then the last thing on our uh, is has to do with standing rules, whether we need to reaffirm them or change them, or uh, do we have any suggestions? Our standing rules. Do I have a copy of that? Give out. Quarterly uh, forecast. I don't know if we're going to have time to do that. We might have to do that afterwards. Here's a copy of the standing rules. I know I had a copy. <laughs> There's enough on that side. There you go. Uh -huh. Here, I have a <coughs> one. I mean, for the most part, it has to do with the format of our meetings mm -hmm. and how they're run. Um, so um, I know we made an adjustment a couple years ago with um, one part of our meeting, which I've been very happy with the way it changed, the way it's gone now. But um, if anybody has any suggestions, Ms. Manning. Um, I believe we had some folks speak with us about the, the time um, that citizens are allowed to speak on certain topics. Right now it looks like um, a citizen can only speak for three minutes on any agenda item. And I believe the way council does it is they can speak for three minutes on each agenda item. So I would like the board to consider perhaps um, that option of having citizens speak on each agenda item for three minutes if they wish. Hmm. Ms. Ben, the way city council does it is as an agenda item comes up. Right. Yes. So yeah. are you and that's about great. three minutes for everybody at one time or as each item comes up? Either way, I'm, 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 open. I'm open to the board would want to do that. Any comments? Any other comments? I did when this came up, I don't know, a while ago, I, I did call several city council people and ask them how they did it. Mm -hmm. And because I said, wouldn't that like take forever? But they said no. So, you know, because at once you think, gosh, that we're going to have so many speakers, but, you know, and it is as they come, which I think is a kind of a good idea because it kind of flows. Mm -hmm. Like you're not talking about item, you know, 13J mm -hmm. at the first, you're talking about 13J, 13J comes up. So I kind of like it to speak as they come up. I think it flows better for us to get the input and for the speakers. But I did ask that question. Hmm. They, 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 the, the three or four that I talked to from city council liked it <clears throat> and said it was not over burdensome for anybody. So if we make changes um, to our standing rules, is it, we wouldn't vote tonight on it. We would have it written up and then vote next time, right? Or right. do you need any the bylaw change in two-thirds? Right, okay, two-thirds <coughs> vote, okay. 
Well, I think I would think you'd present it first, discuss it, and then we'd right. So you know, probably would come. Move it that fast. Usually, we we have been when it, last time we did the bylaw change, math bylaw change. We took it to the PRC first. It was about a year and a half ago. So I didn't even want to get back to the PRC and get the language. They're better suited to knock out large language changes, and they're but just minor things that we need to do. have to go back to PRC. Right. So. Again, thank you for your comments, and we will take it under consideration and ask our PRC to take a look and see if they recommend any changes. Um, were, were there other changes here other than the dates and everything? No. Oh, okay. No. But it's, it says here standing rules may be suspended or amended by a majority vote without notice. So that's just what it says here. Oh, that's that's, that's, that's important in case there's a logical mm -hmm. reason to adjust our well, on, on any given night. You know, that's it's fine. Yeah. So again, though, I don't think it's um it's something that we would handle tonight. Right. Right. Consider. Okay. Yeah. Just consideration. So we have um, three minutes before we're supposed to be in room 113. So that also leaves us, though, with um, our quarterly forecast. Do, can we do that in three minutes? Well, I think we can. <laughs> we're going to have to try to make one adjustment. Oh, let's go this way. I mean, it, <clears throat> we certainly can take it. it. I mean, it doesn't stand in stone, as you all know. And um, we've put down... Oh, we need to come, okay. come around that way. I'll be all right. It's okay. It's up there. I don't need it. Yeah. Yeah. Or not. <laughs> so, I mean, we can make this very short. The um, the workshop, I mean, the format is workshops to the left, information in the middle, action and consent to the right, and then information is based on what we know we're going to bring. Obviously, that changes. Um, sometimes depending on what's happening as far as the organ um, workshop stuff goes. That's just based on conversations that we have had in the past about things that you all would like to see. Um, most of the this quarter obviously it revolves around budget development. Mm -hmm. So most of the workshops will be around budget development. Um, I will have to get back to you regarding your requests uh, actually about a sole source con uh, workshop during this quarter only because i got to find where to squeeze it. So we'll get back to you on that, and if we have a recommended date for that, I'll let you know when that is. Yeah. I mean, I think that would be the only change right now. But otherwise, the workshops are pretty tight. But any questions about that? I'm certainly happy to answer. Does the, any questions, uh, comments? The, uh, the, the workshop on class rank or... Are we looking at moving something forward, potentially forward in policy there? Well, the plan for that particular workshop, and you'll see there's actually two workshops on class rank. There's one in February and then, uh, uh, excuse me, January and another one in March. Um, the first one would be to talk to you about the conversations that we've had internally and then what we think we would, uh, what we would like to recommend, what we think about that. And then we would propose some questions that we would be talking to the community about getting some feedback from the community on and then the one bringing back to you in March would be here's what the community said based on that here's what we think about what we told you before and then we would be asking for some action on part of the board with the hopes of getting it in place for a transition with the rising ninth grade class <coughs> Manny um, I see that Schoology is on here on the on February the 27th um, I don't know if that's something that's going to be requested in our next year's budget if it is, I would kind of like to see that sooner rather than later so we have some time to review that. It's currently in the operating budget. So um, it's already in there. Yeah. It's it already been approved. Shifting gears. Yeah, yeah it was in this oh, operating okay. budget. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Mr. Edwards. There are a couple restrictions that are buried. And I'll say buried. They're, they're in our bylaws regarding public comment. And I honestly even though I chaired the board for a long time. I didn't even know they were in there until they were pointed out to me. Um, they've never been invoked. In a, um, 
and um, next quarter when it fits on the agenda, I will get it out. What I'd suggest is a preliminary look at a workshop and under admin matters and then referral through the uh, policy committee because it would be a, a, a bylaw change. But they are silly things that I just, um, and when, when they hit me, when a group hit me with it, like, you know, you guys don't want to hear from us, blah, blah, blah. I said, oh my gosh, really? I mean, because we've, we've never invoked it. We've never done those things. And it's like, so, and, and, and part of it is, paper copies that we really don't need, some things like that. So. And one of them is uh, item D under public participation, yeah, well, the, cumulative remarks. But we'll yeah. talk about that. Um, yeah, as I say, I'll, 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 I'll bring the suggested changes to a, uh, an admin matters. We can give it a quick look and send it to the committee and get it done. Push, hopefully push through right, because I don't want people out there misreading. We do want to hear from the public, and uh, if there are Stated barriers that have never been used, and the stated barriers ought to go away unless there's a reason to keep them there. I don't think there are. No, obviously, you didn't use them in 17 years. <laughs> 18. No, okay, 18 years. So. I agree with you. Right. Okay. So, all right. So, um, we will um, recess and convene on the um, on the diets at 6 o'clock. Okay, we should mention you are hosting a holiday reception <laughs> right now. One thirteen. So while you are recessing, please don't forget that you are hosting a holiday reception in room one thirteen. So please stop there. Be merry. Do you want to keep this to keep it together?